أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لن تنالوا البر حتى تنفقوا مما تحب وما تنفقوا من شيء فإن الله به عليم صدق الله العظيم When we take care of each other, wonderful things happen. Children thrive, the elderly rejoice, communities celebrate. Awqaf South Africa, a charitable waqaf receiving organization makes it easy to share the care. All donations are plowed into Sharia compliant investments while the fruits support a great variety of charitable causes. Visit the Awqaf South Africa website at awqafsa.org.za to discover how your waqaf can bless our community with the legacy of care. Awqaf South Africa, share the care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and a very warm welcome to all to everyone listening out there and a very warm welcome to the Okaf SA Wakaf Q&A series program. We are very happy today to have Molana Abdul Khalik Ibrahim Ali who is the president of the United Ulama Council of South Africa and also the Deputy President of the Muslim Judicial Council of South Africa. And of course, he's also an ardent supporter of OCA of South Africa and the whole work of system. So uh, without, without much ado, today we are going to be talking to Molana Rukhalik Ali about Islam as a comprehensive way of life, inshallah. And we hope that this is going to be another inspiring session of nasiha and also um, guidance to, to all of us about our, our deen, our beloved deen, our beloved Prophet وسلم, and this beautiful deen of ours. So uh, Molana, just to kick off, the, the first question is, is Islam a religion? Is it an ideology? Is it a cult? Is it a sect? Or any other label that people may give? What 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 would you describe Islam as? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And uh, let me say, you know, it is a blessing for us as Muslims uh, that Allah subhanahu wa taala defines our religion in the glorious Quran. When Allah subhanahu wa taala speaks to us in uh, Surah Ali Imran, Allah subhanahu wa taala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Islam. The deen by Allah, the religion by Allah is Al Islam. And then further, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, al Islam And if you seek any other religion besides Islam as a deen, it shall not be accepted from you. And so the reference of Islam as a deen, as a practical, complete code of life that is consistent with the teachings of all the previous prophets in terms of the fundamental teachings that the prophets came, came with. Therefore, the Quran says about Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, and he says, "Ma kana Ibrahimu yahudiyyan, walakin kana hanifa muslima." 
he was in total submission to Almighty Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. That that references of being Muslim is made to Ibrahim Alayhi Salatu Wasalam. And so when we speak about Islam, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, we speak about a religion. We speak about a uh, life wherein we are governed and guided in terms of our relationship with Allah, the Supreme Being, our Creator, our Sustainer, our Nourisher. Meaning Islam gives us the understanding to be worshipping that Allah is the sole creator. So and then Allah. Islam affords us the opportunity also to be living that is that religion that is pleasing to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shukran Murana. So so what is really meant by when when many people talk about Islam as a comprehensive way of life? What does that entail? Subhanallah. So it so, so it covers everything from your from the time that your day starts till your from, day end. Whatever mm -hmm. whatever is covered from the start of the day to the end of the day, in whatever you will be undertaking in your life, you wake up. There is a manner that we wake up and the prayer that we do when we wake up. There is a, a, a need for us to, to relieve ourselves. The comprehensiveness of the teachings of Islam is that it guides and governs us in terms of how we must be able to relieve ourselves as well. In terms of our eating, eating habits, what to eat, what not to eat, our engagement with our friends and our family, with the broader community and society, Allahu Akbar Islam guides and governs every facet of our life. There is so how, not. Mm -hmm. So how we earn our living, how we spend our, our our money, how we live with our neighbors, how we interact with maybe customers or people that we're transacting with. Would you say that all those aspects are also covered within the deen as well? I would like to respond to say that is Islam. The beauty of Islam is precisely how I engage equally with my neighbor, with my client, with my customer. Um, even if my client is a young child, my mannerism of interacting with that particular child should reflect my Islam. Every facet of life is covered when we speak about Islam. Therefore, Islam is beauty. Islam projects positivity. Islam projects a complete holistic presentation of who I am and what I am in terms of my religion. And may Allah guide us. So, so in terms of that, that would be uh, relating a lot to ourselves as individuals. What about us as a community, as, a, as an ummah, uh, in terms of how we relate to uh, one another or uh, in, in other communities or, um, or, or collectively as an ummah, how we organize ourselves and how we, how we, how we relate perhaps to uh, the, the broader society, like particularly in our country? Indeed. So no man is an island. And the reality of the situation is that uh, our beloved Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa when he laid down the foundation in Medina al Munawwara, it was laid down on the basis of our interaction with our fellow uh, members of community and society. We are not an isolated community. We are part of the broader society. When the Quran speaks about Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, kuntum khayra ummatil ukhritat linnas, you are the best of nations and people. The, the best of nations and people are not isolated and away and distant from the realities that broader community and society are exposed to and what community and, community and society are experiencing. We are real part and parcel of that. And so, be it in the business sphere of life, or be it in the educational sphere of life, 
be it in the health sphere of life or any aspect relating to community and society, Islam has brought about a comprehensive guidance how I should be able to interact and engage with community and society. And so you, we are an ummah, we are part of broader community and society, and we should be able to reflect that. So, Molana, uh, in essence, what is our duty, our, our purpose, and our, our purpose as, and, and what does it mean to be a Khalifa fil Ard? What is our you know, fundamental purpose as, as Allah has created us and, and also as Khalifa to fil Ard? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares this to us in the, right in the beginning of the glorious Quran. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, I am establishing, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the malaika, Khalifatullah fil ard. So when I study those particular uh, verses of the glorious Quran, it follows this amongst the very fundamental methods that speaks Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks there is about the fact that وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاء And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taught Adam alayhi salatu wa salam the names of every of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. So fundamentally, we must be able to create the will and the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this earth. And Allah is mercy. Allah is just. The expectation from this ummah is to establish the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in conformity of our Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as being merciful, compassionate, and kind. And justice and fairness to be part and parcel of the uh, fun fundamental function and duty of Khalifa to Allah. That's the reason why, you know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in, uh, in, in uh, Surah, uh, uh, Surah Nahal, Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan. Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan. Oh, 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 man, I have, uh, uh, I, I have ordered and commanded you to establish justice. Now, the subject of justice is fundamental. It, it is like a clock that ticks at every uh, point zero zero second. It must be able to be implemented. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects expect from us. It's Khalifa to Allah fil art as well. Besides the fact that obviously Allah has established us and created us for his ibadah and worship. Yeah. Mulana, you, you actually mentioned a very beautiful verse there. Uh, and, and which is actually uh, recited every Friday in, in khutbahs around the world in Allah Ya'muru Bil Adli. So that's really, uh, I, I, you know, that really touches my heart when I, when I listen to that verse every every time. Uh, just to conclude, uh, very quickly, uh, you mentioned also about our duties. So uh, th there is a difference between our duties to Allah in our duties to others, to, to human beings, the hukuk Allah and hukuk Ibad. If you can just explain that very briefly, we've just got a few minutes left. Jazakumullah. So very briefly, we are a creation of Allah. We have a responsibility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have a duty to that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We must worship Him. We should not describe any partner unto Him. We should be able to follow His commandments. Do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to do. Refrain from that which he prohibits us from. Then Allah has placed us on this earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to live with fellow human beings. Whom, whom are all his creation. And Allah has given us a duty and responsibility towards our fellow human being. That fellow human being, be it our mother, our father, our brother, our sister, my siblings, my wife, my husband, my in-laws, extended family my neighborhood, in all of this Islam, and our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has expounded on that in terms of my duties and responsibility towards my fellow human being. When it comes to my duties and responsibility to Allah, Allah forgive, if ever there's a violation there in terms of the hukuk of Allah, the duties that I have towards Allah, Allah will forgive. When it comes to my duty and responsibilities and my obligation towards my fellow human being, like for example, Am I trading with a person? I must be fair in terms of my trading. If I violate in any way, 
then Allah expect me to seek or to amend that particular matter as a duty and a responsibility. So I have a I have a dual responsibility towards Allah, my Creator, and my duty towards my fellow human being and to the broader society, obviously. Okay. Jazakallah for that, uh, Molana. Um, I think that clarifies it quite clearly that we have the dual duty of one is to, of, one is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and one is to his entire creation. So just to conclude, Molana, uh, your final message in terms of uh, Islam as a comprehensive way of life. In conclusion, we would like to say, you know, we live in a very challenged community in society. We know what is the economic climate today. We know what is the moral degeneration in our community and society. Our appeal to our viewers is that uh, let us return to the beautiful teachings and the noble teachings of the glorious Quran and the Sunnah. And I would like to, take, uh, I would like to uh, motivate that our people must be able to get closer in since this particular project or program is being hosted by Al-Qaf, it's a importance for us to understand the, the deep meaning of Waqf. And for our understanding around that would mean that if we talk about sustainability, if we talk about the great good for community and society, then Waqf plays a very central role in this particular uh, upholding of the moral well-being of community and society. Jazakallah khairan, uh, Mulana, and Barakallah Fik. It was really a great pleasure having you on this particular program. And we hope, inshallah, that we will be interacting again in the future. Barakallah Fik. May Allah bless you and may Allah give you success in everything that you do, inshallah. And make dua for us as well in, in all our endeavors. Barakallah Fik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Quality education is a cornerstone of a thriving, prosperous society. However, the South African education system is under strain, necessitating the work of the Awqaf South Africa Education Waqaf to help ease the pressure. Our metric mathematics upgrade project alone has already impacted the lives of over 6,000 matriculants. At the Darul Arqam High School in Mitchell's Plain, the pass rate increased from 70% to a remarkable 100%. For one student in particular, it was a life-changing experience. With the very first word of the Holy Quran being revealed as Iqra, read, educating our community is an act of faith. With your help, we can transform many more lives. Awqaf South Africa, share the care.
water as the most precious blessing from Allah. It gives and sustains life while purifying humankind and the earth. The Awqaf South Africa Water and Sanitation Waqaf is dedicated to assisting schools and communities in need of water, thereby impacting on the lives of thousands, especially in rural communities, in drought-prone areas of South Africa. The need is hard to quench, as is the joy and gratitude of those who benefit from it. One borehole can cost as much as 80,000 Rand. It may sound overwhelming, but when we all pitch in, it's doable. How much will you pitch in, Awqaf South Africa? Share the care. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the third edition of Moments in History brought to you by OCAF South Africa. I'm your host Shafiq Morton, but of course our special guest is Ibrahim Ruder, uh, well known for his research on Somerset West, but of course he has done a tremendous amount of work in terms of understanding and interpreting the history of our Cape Muslim community. Ibrahim, assalamu alaikum. Welcome to tonight's show. Salam, Shafiq. Nice to be back again. Now, when we, we finished off, you'd been talking about the, the Methodists, how much land they bought in the Hottentots Holland Bowl, so called. But there was a community, um, and I, I think the place used to be called Mostert's Bay, you can correct me, a small Muslim community that survived and that today is thriving from those roots uh, all those years ago. Tell us more. Yes. That's why I said in the last program at the Strand, it was a totally different story. From the reports, from their very own missionary reports, I went through the reports. They, the first thing they did, they realized, look, yeah, in that particular period, according to Peggy, it was about plus minus 700 slaves in, in, in the basin of the Solan's ward. And for sure they would target these slaves because they've already got the land. The next thing is you get them onto the land where they can build their own houses. There would be enough water, the two furrows, so that they can have their own garden and sustain themselves. But at the Strand, it was a totally different story because initially, I found it as early as 1822. And this is confirmed by another writer of the Dutch Reformed Church by the name of Hopkins when he wrote a book on the 150th anniversary of the, the Dutch Reformed Church of Somerset West. And he confirms that in 1822, people were busy putting up huts at Mustard Bay. And that is the very year in which Imam Abdul Samad, with five of his compatriots, mostly from Java, when they settled at Mossad Bay. Now, prior to that, he stayed in Cape Town. And my, my question that I pose is, how come there's an Imam here at Mossad Bay in 1822? And in the census of 1825, that community had grown to about roughly 27. <laughs> Uh, of the 27, 19 were males, and of the 19 males, 14 were from Java. So we see already then by 1825, there is a preponderance of Muslims at the settlement, and they were all fishermen. I mean, where they came from, they knew the sea, so they could virtually survive out of the sea. And my question is, where did they come from? So I went to the Ophaf roll, and you know the census. It's taken mm -hmm. by the King Connect every year. And I started with the Ophaf roll of Cape Town. And there's a beautiful one called RDG 115. 
And I think that must have been just before the British took over or just after that, 1806. It's undated, but according to the age of the son of Twanguru on that census, he was about 13 years old. So I take it that must have been around about between 1807 and 1810. And those people who were now at Mustard Bay, they were listed. Imam Abdul Samad, he was 50 years old. A very good friend of his, Potter, who stayed with him at Mustard Bay, was also staying with him in Cape Town in a stirchi. And in fact, next to Potter's name, there was a, a written a little note, Het zijn pas verloren. It tells you that even the free blacks, like the slaves, they had to have a dom pass before they could leave the city. And then I also found Wong uh, Ongo. He's also mentioned in the testament of the Imam. They were all staying in Cape Town. Now, why did they move out of Cape Town? And this is where the Hijra comes in to glean the pastures to see, because they were living in abject poverty in Cape Town. Here's an opportunity to sell my expertise, to sell my labor to the farmers in the Rotten Tatarab area and in Stellenbosch and in the world of Modal Hut, this is where it is today. And that is how they moved out of the city in search of a better life. But at the same time, when they were searching, the missionaries were hunting. They were hunting these people to bring them into the fold of Christianity. And this is where the Imams moved into the inferior. And I, I'm so glad. I said, what makes Imam Abdul Samad unique is that we can prove his movement by using the Ophav role. In 1810, he was in Cape Town. In 1815, he was staying with July from Bukis in Stellenbosch. In 1820, he moved to the Somerset West area and he was a flech, a sort of a foreman on the farm of the Mayberg in Somerset West. In the same year, he moved to another farm near Gordon's Bay called Gastro Fontaine. And that's 1820. And by 1822, he settled with five compatriots at Mustard Bay. It is a place where they could stake out a place to live, where they could, I won't say own, but they could have a piece of land. It was crown land. It didn't belong to them. They all settled illegally on crown land, and I'll come to that later. Uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating story, isn't it? And just to sort of add on to what you were saying, um, if one reads early accounts of what it was like in Cape Town, uh, it wasn't a pleasant stay, place to live in, wasn't it? There was no running water. There was no sewerage. The Muslim community had, to, I think, to use water from the Hrach that used to run down near where the Owl Mosque is today. Um, the river that used to run in, into Adelaide Street where there was a river, no running water, no paved roads, dust in, in, in summer, mud in winter, and of course there was the, uh, the racism and the political climate. Like physically, it was a horrible place to be in, wasn't it? Absolutely. In fact, I posed this question to Halil Katharada on, on Radio 7. I said, Halil, what do you think? What was the most difficult work that the slave had to perform in the city of Cape Town, per se? Uh, they had some idea about transport. They said maybe when they had to cross the mountain, the hotel, the hotel, they had to dismantle the whole ox wagon. Yes, that was difficult. But I'm speaking to the city, per se. What work mm. was the most difficult work? And you just mentioned now the night soil. They, they, they had to carry over their shoulder like a gift and put on the oxen, you know, with two wooden buckets. And they had to carry the night soil right from the residential area up to the waterfront and dump it in the sea. It's still happening today, the pipes of the Ramsey you see there. That was the one word. And I remember there was one incident when one, two of these slaves, or one of them, accidentally, I don't know whether it's accidentally or purposefully, they dropped these buckets with, with the feces in front of a shop in, in the year in front as an stream. And it was actually a court case. I think this all written up in, in Jackie Lewis' book about slavery. And eventually the, the, the owner, she was fine. And, and the slaves, they were, were lashed because they said they did it purposely. It was the most difficult work. The second one was gathering wood because wood was the only form of providing energy for the ovens domestically and for the bakeries. But by the 1800s, most of the trees in the city, in the environs of the city, had been chopped off. 
So they had to walk long distances to go fetch wood and carry it back to the city. And this is where the communication between runaway, runaway slaves came in. Those who had to go fetch the wood, they would have some sort of a dealing with the runaway slave living up in the mountain, in Table Mountain, and said, look, we provide the wood for you when you come, and you see that we get food and sometimes even flint locks and guns, whatever you can see when you bring it to us. So that communication system was in place between the runaway slaves and those slaves who had to do to fetch the wood in the city. Speaking of the water, that is why we have the Beitengracht and we have the Jerengracht. It's actually a little canal because there was no running water, no tap water, in fact. And another question that, that, that I posed, who did the laundry of the city? And that is where the Malay women come in. They went up right to the streams in Platakluf. And I think there's an American girl, I met her at some seminar, basically, where she did research on that. And she found so many buttons and points in the stream there in the Platakluf of the washing, the laundry that took place there. Uh, the buttons and things, they broke off because there wasn't enough soap around. So what they did, and they did this in India too, we saw this in India, they hit the, the cloth on a piece of rock. Now mm -hmm. in the process, a lot of the buttons and the coins were lost. And this is the said that this American student did. So we see that the slaves had to work very hard for their survival in the city. No, absolutely. And of course, moving to Mostert's Bay or, or um, Somerset West, as we might, might call it, uh, I find it fascinating as somebody of the ocean of how these guys manage to change oceans. You know, um, if you go to Indonesia, fishing there is a completely different game to fishing in False Bay. I mean, That's in Indonesia, you're dealing with coral reefs, different species, the water is warmer, and it's not as dangerous as a False Bay is. This must have been um, quite a transition, and I think it's a tribute to the innate in intelligence of these people that they were able to fish in False Bay. I really think it's a tribute to that. Absolutely, Shafiq. You see, Shafiq, the beauty of, of, of False Bay, even at the time of Van Ribi, they came this side too to catch fish because the the supply of fish in the bay was, was, was I would say it was tremendous because Peggy Heap refers to uh, an incident where they had to use oxen to pull out the hundred thousand others when they trekked. And I, I mean, I've experienced of the trek with some of the older fishermen when I was a youngster. Mm -hmm. uh, they walk in with a net and then they, like a semicircle, they come out and they pull the others to uh, the, the, the shore. But this was so heavy, they had to use oxen to put out the nets with more than a hundred thousand others. Now, it tells you the richness of the bay. And I think the choice of the Imam of the Samad and his cohorts to settle there, firstly, they had to make sure there was water, because no settlement can survive without water. I mean, Robert Ross refers that to that, where communities thrive, but they couldn't survive because of the lack of a sustainable source of water. But in the case of Horton and Holland, we had a, a winter rainfall, right? So in winter, the, the, the streams would be running full, meandering into Falls Bay. There were a lot of streams. But in addition to Mustard Bay, and this I found in a map, a, taken in, a survey done in 1879 by the government surveyor, where it indicates that where they were settled, there was also a flay of fresh water, which means that in the summer, when the streams dried up, they had enough fresh water to survive. And in addition, I found Everson, that some of them were even farming on a small scale towards the latter half of the 19th century. Now, they were not left alone by the missionaries. By 1833, after he bought the land, the first thing they did, they built a school and a chapel. By 1835, there was a school for the slave children operated in Somerset West. Uh, you refer to the strand as Somerset West, it had so many names. It was called it Mossad Bay, and Mossad Bay has been there since 1714 already, when there was a guy who was attacked by slave, David Dubijon, the French guy. So by then, the southern boundary of his farm, uh, uh, Floyd Bay, was Mossad Bay. So it's been in existence for quite a while. But over time, it was also called Van Reimerfeldsdorf. It was the resident mm -hmm. at the time. And then it was called 
some of it with strand. And eventually, mm -hmm. to cut a long story short, it just came down to strand. And that is Mustard Bay was the original name where Abdul Samad and his cohort settled. Now, by 1835, the school was operated in Somerset West. And now here, here comes in, my, my thing is the missionaries, they were in cahoots with the colonial powers because when the phrase, when the slaves were set free, right, it means it would be a loss of labor to the farmer, right? But the slaves in, in, on their side again, they would be ne in need of work. So they, the mission station couldn't provide work for all of them, so they had to be employed either on the farm or in other, some other form of private people. They had to find employment. So, Barabashaw, then in 1850, he built, with his cohorts, they built a little school near the beach. I was so fortunate when I was at Corey Library at Grandstand, at the Roach University in Grandstand, there was a, a Corsa guy. You know, he's been working for 40 years in that library. He knows that library like the palm of his hand. Mm. And I said, to him, I said to him, you know, really, his name was really. I said, really, you know, I read a book about Peggy Heap that they built a little hole on the on the beach near, near Mustard Bay. Would there be any record of that? Uh, you know, really stayed away for about an half an hour. Eventually, he came back with a little newspaper called The Churchman, dated 1912, July 1912. And there was a sketch. There was a picture, actually, of the little school that they built at Mossad Bay in 1850. But in any case, in their reports between 1863 and 1900, they were very hopeful that they would be able to convert the Malay children to Christianity. But there's one report that says we cannot get the children to come to school on a Sunday, on the Sabbath. I think that the, the fishermen that sat away, they were wise enough. Because the curriculum on Sundays was purely biblical and catechism. And I think the Muslims were slim for looking at me, you know, I can also Christmas as a son of school. And the report says they cannot get the Malay, the, the Mohammedan children to come to school on a Sunday. And I think again, there is the prudent the wisdom of our Islamic leadership at Master Bay. We were happy to send our children to get secular education because they were being taught writing and reading and arithmetic, either in Dutch or in English, whichever. But they were not prepared to have their children converted to Christianity. And all the reports indicate, you know, what I admire about the missionaries, they, they, they had a lot of perseverance. They were very patient and very hopeful. But I think the approach, it didn't succeed with the Muslims at Mosque Bay. Now, how can I prove that? Now, I was fortunate. I came to know the, the minister of the Methodist Church in Somerset West, the Reverend Head Bush. And I went to him. He stayed in the mains there on, on the property of the church. The very place where they built the school, the school is still there, is the oldest school in the, in, in the Hotel Holland Basin. The method of school in some ways. So I, I told him, Look, I'm busy with research with my thesis, and uh, do you have any record of your baptism that took place in Austin Bay? Fortunately, he had the baptismal register dated from 1847. And I sat for weeks on end day from eight in the morning until one going through that register. And I found that during that period from 1850, up to 1900, there were 168 baptisms at Mosul Bay. And of the 168, only three were of Malays who embraced Christianity. And the three, they were elderly people. And I found afterwards from the records that the father was a Muslim and the mother was a Christian. And eventually those daughters, they, they were adults. Her age, her age from 18 to 23, there were three of them, they were baptized. But no Muslim child was baptized in that little church, the chapel, both near the beach at Mustard Bay.
Absolutely amazing stuff. Unfortunately, we have to end uh, today's edition of Moments in History. Our special guest, Ibrahim Roeder. And of course, we will, inshallah, get him back later during the month because there's so many things we haven't even discussed. We need to have a look at the community today uh, in, in, in Somerset West or the Strand. Who are they today? And some very interesting travels. The, the Quran family went on and so many other discoveries. But we will definitely, uh, Ibrahim Rode, we'll be, we, be, we are calling you back. It's a must because I think people have a right to know about the history of the Strand. We can't forget uh, the, the great history of a great people in that part of the world. But Ibrahim Roda, thank you for joining us on Moments in History. And I promise you, you are coming back, inshallah.
Imagine for a moment losing your sight and then the joy of getting it back. In South Africa, about 200,000 people are in need of cataract surgery, making it a top priority of Alkaf South Africa's healthcare funding. With a special focus on the elderly, it enables us to fulfill the command of our Creator to take care of those in need. Since 2005, our Cataract Wakaf Fund has co-funded over 6,000 such surgeries in partnership with the Islamic Medical Association, the Islamic Circle of Southern Africa, and other donors. With your help, we can restore the gift of sight to even more of our precious elderly and with it, the blessing of reading the Qur'an, pledge your support today. Eyes for Allah, nothing but Allah, that is the beginning of Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban to Arabic Bites Ramadan 2021. Previously, we spoke about the Arabic alphabet and more specifically about our friend Hamza. And we said that the sound known as a uh, and e and u is not the sound of the alif, which is commonly believed, but is the sound of the Hamza. So then the natural question would be, what is the sound of the alif? Well, alif has no sound. The Arabic language has 28 consonants, all of them having sound. The only vowel is alif. 
And ALIF is used for elongation and nothing more, as I will demonstrate. If you were to write B, you would say B. And then I would to write for you all an alif after the ba, you would say ba, and no one would say ba. But as soon as I add hamza and sit it upon the alif, you say ba. Hence confirming that the sound that we make of a, e, u is in fact the sound of the hamza and not the sound of the alif. So, how do we look at Hamza and Alif and differentiate between them? Well, it's very simple. Hamza is of two types. al wasl and al qati Hamza al qati is the Hamza that we all know denoted in the proper form. Hamza al wasl is an invisible Hamza denoted as a small sod. What is the difference between Hamza al wasl and Hamza al qati Can be known through application in the Quran al karim However, most of us are not aware of these differences. For example, if I wrote the word Alhamdu and I wrote the word Mu'min, both of these words are mentioned in the Quran. Let's look at them from afar. Alhamdu has no Hamza on it. However, we make the sound of a, uh, telling us that the Hamza to Wasl in fact exists there and not the Hamza to Qatar that we know. How about when we say Rabbil Alameen? What do we see here? I see one alif and I see a second alif. The first one is what we would call a hamza to wasl on top of the alif. And the second one is just an alif. So the rule says that if any word begins with the alif, then the alif is not alone. It has a hamza to wasl with it. And if a alif is found anywhere inside the word, then that is not just that is not a Hamza al wasl but is an alif on its own, hence only providing a vowel sound of elongation and nothing more. So, not to confuse ourselves, we have alif, which is only found in, in the middle of words. We have the alif or the Hamza al wasl which is only found at the beginning of the words. And we have our original Hamza, which is found anywhere and is always pronounced as a, e, and u. So, to sum up, we have three things. We have Alif. We have Alif with Hamza to Wasl. And we have Hamza, which is known as Hamza to Qatar. The difference between the sound of Hamza to Wasl and Hamza to Qatar. The difference is simple. Hamza to wasl is only pronounced if you begin on a word. If you do not, it is not pronounced. So it is specific. Whereas Hamza to Qatar is pronounced always. So I would say. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen because I begin on the word. But if I were to continue from Bismillah, 
I would say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Milhamdu and skip over it because I did not begin on the Hamza. However, Hamza al Qati' is always pronounced and is never left out, no matter on which letter it comes on, no matter where it occurs in the beginning, middle, or end, and no matter how it occurs. So it is always pronounced and never ever left out. For example, Iyaka Na'budu. Iyaka Na'budu. We would always say Iyaka. Even if we were to continue from the ayah previously, we would never leave out the sound of the Hamzatul Qati'. And that wraps up Hamzatul Wasl and Hamzatul Qati'a for us. Inshallah, until we meet again. إلى اللقاء والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Every single orphan child in South Africa should have the opportunity to enjoy a carefree childhood but with over 2 million children in need of orphan care the need is greater than the available resources the Quran reminds us of two fundamental rights of orphan children, the right to support and the right to be treated with dignity. The Quran furthermore sees taking care of orphans as an act of worship. By supporting the Awqaf South Africa Yatim Waqaf, you will help us support a number of children's homes with the upgrading of infrastructure, their health care, education, clothing and overall well-being. Help us share the care and give an orphaned child a chance at a happy childhood and a bright future. Um, we're going to continue now with our writing um, writing with a normal pen so in the previous lesson if you haven't watched that one it's very important to go back and watch the first tutorial of writing Arabic with a normal pen okay so this is a normal pen and this is a calligraphy pen um, this is actually a Java read the thorn of some type of tree some type of um, either it's a palm or it's a thorn uh, coming from all the way from Indonesia it's called the Java reed <coughs> and uh, this pin that I particularly use for my calligraphy it's a very special pin it was a gift uh, to me um, it is I call it the Tuan Guru pin inshallah may Allah make us benefit from Tuan Guru's knowledge as we know he in South Africa, he he penned or he wrote the Quran many times uh, in order to make da'wah and to teach at the Awal Masjid and to, to teach the uh, free slaves. Anyway, nevertheless, uh, we're going to continue. So, um, <clears throat> Alif, Ba, Jim, and Dal. Those are the first four letters. Spelling also Abjad. The next letter, obviously these, one, two, three, four, these letters, some of them you can see goes on the line and some of them below the line. One, which is the jim, and also we said that the ba, ta, and tha, all has the same shape, so it doesn't matter. Dal and dal, same, so I'm not going to put the dots there, it depends what you write, if you're using that shape. Um, <clears throat> So the next one, we are going to do Ra, okay? So Ra, part of it goes above the line, part of it below. So as we know the Dal, the Ba, we can see the height of that letter is basically in the, in the middle line. So think of this imaginary line in the center of your line and you're going to use that as a, as a guideline, okay? But the raw part of it above, like this, one mark like that, and one mark like this, that's one type of raw. It's one, two, three. Okay? 
So be in mind, there's going to be a point. With a normal pin, you won't be able to see that. But for example, if we write a raw, this will be the baseline. And so, for example, if the alif is sitting above the line, the alif would end there, right? So, with raw, we go like that, that should be the first mark. Two, like that. And you see down to the bottom line so this is this is actually below the baseline and then we make a small point like that so you won't be able to get this effect with a normal pin but we just mimic the shape so it's like at one two three so that's basically the shape of the rock the obviously you put a dot on right <clears throat> raw and zap. Then you get another raw. The other raw which has two parts to it, right? One part is going to be above the line, like that. And another part, if you kind of like flip this in the uh in the opposite direction, it's gonna you see, it's two of the same parts, it's just flipped around, and then you bring the the ending part, you bring it up. To the line like that so this is called a raw mudrama and this is also going to be the size of an alif right now raw mudrama it's called that because you'll see now you can join it to another letter right mudra means it's going to be um, merged right so if we put a dot on here it might symbolize a, a noon noon ra or ba ra or ya ra so be careful this one usually is used only for ra if it's on its own like this without any dots it's ra um, if you want to write the za you need to use this shape over here, right? So on your on your lines, um, we're going to do this, not as high as the raw or the dot. One, two, three, like that. Again, one, two, three, and be in mind, like I said, it's going to be the width of an alif. Okay, the next one, raw and scene. Okay, so the scene basically scene is going to have three parts. One, it's like a V shape. Can you see? It's going like a tilted V. Normal V is going to be like that, but this one, the V is kind of facing that way. Then number two you have that shape which is like a, a curved shape or a bucky and then three is the lower section so this is going to be above the line so again one two and up like this so if I write that with a normal with a calligraphy pin it's going to be one two that's my V-shape. So this, usually there is a space of one nuqtadi. Then we go down like that. And can you see there's a slight angle to this as well. Right? And then we make our lower section like this. This will be two dots beneath the, the, the line. So this again, the baseline. And we make this shape like a noon. Okay? And like I said, this is lower, that point that doesn't go higher than this. It's all going down like that. So this will be around about three dots. Altogether, your scene 
is going to be longer than an alif, so it's going to be about seven dots. You're going to have one and a half dots space here. So this section, the second tooth of the scene, is actually wider than the first part of the scene. So altogether it's one, two and a half. And then again uh, you have about three dots, one, two, three, three to four dots here, so it's four, uh, five, six, six to seven, six to seven dots. So again, writing on your lines, in your line, you're going to start roughly in the same height like the raw, this raw here, and we go one, make our V-shape, two, like that, three, like that. One, two, three. And there's your scene. And sheen, of course, right? Now, when you make the dots, for example, you want to put dots on scene, right? In calligraphy, we learn that this angle here is the angle of your dots as well. So, it's slightly tilted, right? Can you see that the dot on the right side, if you put two dots next to each other, the dot on the right side is always going to be a little bit higher than the dot on the left. Because this is the flow of your... This is the way that the text is written. So it's never going to be written like this. One, two, three. You can't have this angle of three dots. It's going to be like that. If it's two dots, one, two. So one, two. Two, and you always keep it close together. Now, when you're doing dots with a normal pin, you just have to one, two, three. Can you see how I kind of one, two, three? You can't keep it too close together, otherwise, you won't notice it. And uh, we're going to do one more letter, which is the sod. So, sod again, like seen, a part is going to be above the line and part below the line. So we can do it like this. One. Okay. All together, this is going to be three dots. So you imagine, if this is three dots, remember what we said, Alif is five dots. Right? One, two, three, four, five. Alif is five dots. So this is going to be shorter than Alif. I mean, if we lay the Alif that way. And so, so you think of the Alif as this width over here. And that's the side. Then we come down here and you go up. At the end, you leave the space open here. That's very important. And then we do the same thing with the scene. We just create this bowl shape here. Once again, as you can see, this side is lower than that side. Okay, so this is the method of writing side with a calligraphy pin. We write it with our normal pin. One. Can you see how this is? It's curving, but it's going in that direction. Right? Up and that direction. Then we create this like a bar, like a bar shape. Yeah. And at the end, we leave this extra bit of space over there. Go down and make that curve. Again, this is going to be a similar width to the scene. About seven dots. But writing with a normal pin on the line, one, two, three, like that. And obviously, thought, thought, and thought. Now, one thing that I also have to note is something we call kashida. And kashida is basically to justify you're going to stretch a letter, right? So, for example, we did ba. You can stretch the bar. So basically, you can say maybe one and a half times longer. That's the basic um, amount of dots that you're going to stretch. So if the bar width is five dots, one, two, three, four, five. Sorry, that's very far apart. Then I'm going to add six, seven, eight, nine. Let's say nine, nine dots. If this is my line over here, where I'm going to write my bar, I do the same, the beginning strokes is the same. But watch the end, 
the end is going to get a different ending it's going to point like that right so this depth of this curve here is about a half a dot so if I do that with my normal pin I go one two like that you can stretch the sod as well scene and sod if you want to stretch scene you're going to do this this is the line it's this is the head is going to remain above the line you just do the bottom part of your your scene is like that think of a little bit a little fish swimming in this direction okay so this is your scene sod also like scene you keep this part above the line and you can practice ba ta tha scene sod and writing it like that so if we write this now onto our normal lines like that okay. now with this with this sizing that you're using here you're going to have to skip a line you can't write immediately on the next line because as you can see in future you're going to add markings uh, diacritical marks so um, the next one we skip a line and then we write on the next line so sod like that uh, like that you can ta -ta. You can't stretch gym like this. Gym is a different way. I'll show again. Um, you can't stretch the raw. You can stretch the body of the scene and sheen and sod and rod as I showed there. You can also do that and if you want to write something inside. For example, we say sod and we stop here. Well, Quran, for example, I can do that. Sod. Well, Quran. Ni. Okay. That's an example of how you can use a kashida. You can also use the kashida, or the mashq, or this, the tawila we call it, um, for if you just want to leave this open, you don't need to write anything inside. You can't write anything inside the bar, and, but for letters that go beneath the line, like this, for example, sod and sin, you can write inside. <laughs> When we take care of each other, wonderful things happen. Children thrive, the elderly rejoice, communities celebrate. Awqaf South Africa, a charitable waqaf receiving organization makes it easy to share the care. All donations are plowed into Sharia compliant investments, while the fruits support a great variety of charitable causes. Visit the Awqaf South Africa website at awqafsa.org.za to discover how your wakaf can bless our community with the legacy of care. Awqaf South Africa, share the care. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidil Mursaleen wa ala alihi wa ashabihi al-tahirin wa ba'd. رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لسان يفقو قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته There's a beautiful narration of the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه سلم that reads as follows من تصدق بعدل تمرة من كسب طيب 
wala yaqbalullahu illa tayyiban that when a person gives a charity be it the equivalent of a date when he gives this charity what happens to this particular charity the narration says fayaqbalullahu bi yamini fayurabbiha kama yurabbi ahadukum fulwahu allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts this charity and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes this charity to grow like one of you would cause his fall to grow now this parable is really unique because when we look at the Arabs, they had different uh, classes of wealth, they had different assets, they had livestock in general, then they had horses, they had date palms, they had vineyards. Of the most prized position was the horses. And they would have assistants, and the assistants would assist in managing other forms of wealth. But when it came to the horses, the Arab owner undertook nurturing and growing, looking after the horse himself. Which means that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes on our charity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself undertakes to look after and to grow this investment that we have, have made. And one of the most important lessons that we learn from this narration is that a charity is really an investment. So when we give a, a, a charity, it's an investment we are making. And inshallah, we will experience the fruits, the return, the yields of that particular investment, both in this world as well as in the year after. We find that at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the example of Uthman radiallahu an, he made such an investment. On the day of Tabuk, he had invested in half of the army that were to sit out on the Tabuk expedition. As a result of this particular investment, what return did he get? The Prophet said to him, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive your past and your future sins. Look at that investment and look at the yield more importantly. When it comes to the year after, um, the greatest aspiration that we can have is for the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because if we acquire the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the year after then our felicity, our eternal felicity is secured. How did Uthman secure his felicity in the year after? By making an investment, by spending his wealth in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we talk about investment, when you think about investment in relation to your material wealth, what do you do? Uh, generally, you partner up with an asset management company by way of example. They will invest the money and both yourself as well as the asset management company will enjoy the, the returns. Uh, the same applies to Islamic uh, investments. You need to partner up. And this idea of partnering up in terms of this type of investment is uh, explained in the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks and mentions in Surah An-Nisa, so uniquely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word shafa'a. Now literally the word shafa'a means to be even. And the opposite of shafa'a is witter, which means to be alone. If I can give you an example, an extraneous example to our discussion. The example is when you greet somebody. So when you offer the greeting, you are alone, that is witter. But when you greet somebody and that person responds, you are no longer alone, but rather you now even. And therefore, greeting somebody is considered a form of, of shafa'a, a form of partnering up with a, another. In the context of this particular verse, which refers to starting out in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a person is alone. Um, you enable this person by sponsoring him and now he's able to start in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you receive the reward of shafa'ah. And what is the reward of shafa'ah? May yashfa'a shafa'atan hasanatan. Whoever partners up in a good cause, yakullahu nasibun minha, that he will receive a portion of that particular reward. We take this opportunity to invite you to partner up with us as the Nair Youth Foundation in terms of making an investment for the year after like Uthman radiallahu an did and we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it be a means of our felicity both in this world as well as in the year after Ameen Ya Rabbal Alameen Alhamdulillah by the grace and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, the Nair Youth Foundation is a registered NPO and a registered PBO uh, the Nair Youth Foundation uh, makes a difference by enriching lives. This particular enrichment happens in one of two ways. Uh, the first way is through our social development programs. We have uh, direct aid, 
we have our soup kitchen and we have uh, parcel outreach programs that happens on a continuous basis. Alhamdulillah. The second uh, aspect of this enrichment happens through our uh, education. By the grace and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have Tajdeed, a Quran program that seeks to develop uh, learners beyond the mechanical memorization of the Quran, but rather developing them as holistic individuals. Uh, the second subsidiary in our education uh, department would be the Awal Academy, which is an afternoon supplementary school. Alhamdulillah, uh, the Nayu Youth Foundation, through its social development programs and through its educational programs, um, affords you an ideal opportunity to make an investment in you, uh, through which you will experience uh, returns both in this world as well as in the year after. So when uh, channeling your zakah, or when channeling your sadaqah, or any of your other uh, philanthropy, uh, consider uh, the Nayu Youth Foundation. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Every community has heroes. They may not have superpowers, yet they make a real difference to the lives of those around them. From imparting knowledge and providing relief, to spreading smiles, to help one such hero is to help all of their community. This Ramadan, multiply your rewards by empowering our Imams. Donate to Imam Development Program and support the few who help the many. Donate now www.imamdp.org forward slash donate. As the leading charitable work-off institution in Southern Africa, OCAF SA for the past 17 years invests your dedicated work-off donations into income-generating assets like shopping centres, industrial buildings, factories, office blocks and apartments. The income earned from investments allows us to fund a variety of humanitarian and community projects. The investment strategy guidelines adopted by OCAF SA are as follows. Location combination of community, provincial, national and offshore. Returns, balance of social and financial returns within constraints of strategy with a bias to maximization of financial returns. Diversification and risk, spread risk with bias at low risk and diversified portfolio. Investment portfolio, combination of property and equity. Equity participation, public, OCAF, institutional partnership possibilities. Currency and inflation, hedge, factor into consider. Currency and inflation, hedge, factor into strategy. Restriction, OCAF SA may not invest in unethical or Islamically unacceptable projects. Be part of the prophetic practice of changing lives and pledge your support. OCAF SA, providing sustainable solutions purely for the love of Allah. OCAF South Africa, our community sovereign fund. <laughs>
we know historically our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, has set up the concept of waqf and we know about the date farms and some of the, the, the farms that were set up and the produce from there was the Subah of Jariya and also the well of Uthman Radial Anhu. And here we had different kind of waqafs. The one was a waqaf producing uh, produce that would be invested, the funds for that would be invested in the community to develop the community. And here we had another waqaf that was a well where the Muslim community drew water from, this water which is really the, the essence of, of sustenance of life. Waqaf, the actual original word means detention. But in a legal sense, waqaf is, as Nabi Muhammad wasalam, had said, tie your asset to Allah Almighty and distribute its fruits. So the first example of a waqaf was the masjid itself, Masjid al Quba, Masjid al Nabawi. But the legal understanding of waqaf emerged in the time of Hazrat Umar. Uh, Hazrat Umar, radiallahu an, when he had landed property, expensive property, in Khaybar, and he asked advice for the Nabi Muhammad and he advised him that he should retain this to Allah Almighty and his fruits for charity. And that's the first formal known waqf that jurors have identified. The waqf system in Islam, the first one that started that is the Prophet Sallallahu Waqf means that you habs, means you hold something for the benefit of something else. Waqf is where you make a donation and you use the, take the donation, we invest the donation and we use the returns from the donation. Uh, if you look from the beneficial or the benefits from waqf, I think Islam is built on the social welfare of the Muslim community, meaning that there is a system in place always to look after the people. We also have the waqf of Hazrat Uthman, which is the famous well. Over the centuries, it expanded to not only mosques and schools, colleges, hospitals, uh, musafir khanas or travel lodges, drinking wells and so on. And it is a concept that became a very powerful economic financial tool for the economic distributive justice. From my simple understanding, a waqf is really a trust that belongs to Allah. A waqf can be a masjid, it can be a school, it could be uh, anything that is given in trust that lives on in perpetuity. SubhanAllah, the benefits of, of, of creating a waqf, big or small, is that the benefits of it acts as a saraka jariya, it lasts forever. As long as the waqf is alive and continues to strive and benefit others, inshallah it will benefit you as the person who founded this waqf. Waqf South Africa started 17 years ago with a group of businessmen who invested 10,000 rand each, so a total of 100,000 rand in seed money and we were approached by Dr. Token, Akhta Token and Zainul Kaji to put together and join hands to develop this little fund and Alhamdulillah we found over a period of time this fund has been growing and has been developing. My involvement with OKAF South Africa started I think from the very very beginning with Uncle Zainul and uh, Harun Kala approaching me and saying could I be involved and subhanAllah, I was uh, really, really amazed, not by the, the beautiful intentions with which it began, but how it has flourished over the years. Being a founder member, being a founder trustee of Okaf South Africa, uh, we find that in the whole of South Africa, basically, so many people already has benefit. With regards to Okaf, my involvement currently is that um, I'm a patron trustee. Um, Harun Kala met me and he asked me to get myself involved. Um, they needed people in the Durban region. It, is, um, it has three or four very essential principles. The first is that the waqf itself must have a religious motive in that it earns the blessings and favor of Allah Almighty. The second is that it is in perpetuity, irrevocable, cannot be recalled. And the third is that it must be 
for the benefit of mankind. Okaf is, inshallah, we are planning and we are in the mode of eradicating poverty, of not uplifting people just to a point where we give them money for the week. We want to say we give them, hopefully, the fishing rod, not the fish. And that's the, the, the big shift that we as a community need to make now. Yes, alhamdulillah, we have many good organizations and we, have, we say, please contribute to everybody. We say take 10% of that and put it as a wakaf. And very shortly, within seven years, you'll find that 10% that you've put away become the 100% of what you're giving away every year. So in other words, whatever a person donating, they're donating 10 rand, the 10 rand is not used up, but the return from that 10 rand is used. It's not the zakat system. It is a system where it is for everybody that would apply for every little thing. From the biggest to the smallest. It could be a bench in a park. It could be a tree in the park. It could be a bird's nest or provision for birds and animals. It could be schools, colleges, libraries, books, carpets, curtains, Qurans, publications, uh, salaries for the Imam, provision for the mosque, etc. And I, I, I will be shy to, to, to sort of make exception in saying that particular aspect of it, but be it from the medical side, be it from the social side, be it from the educational side, that so many people already has benefited. And this reminds me also of a very important one that Okaf South Africa is doing every year, and that is the leadership program, where young people are being trained to become leaders of the future, which I think is a very important aspect. And I think that has been done so many a times, and alhamdulillah, today we see the fruits of that. What are the three most important things that we can, our parents can leave behind? It's a good child who does good work, and the parent gets the benefit of that work. It's whatever a parent may have left behind in terms of a book or knowledge that people can benefit from, that becomes a sawab ajariya. And the third is an investment that we can do on behalf of our parents, a wakaf. And that money becomes a sawab ajariya for them on a continuous basis forever.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فهو المحتد وما يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله Dear viewers, I greet you all with the best of greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Meaning, may the peace, blessings, and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon you all. You're welcome to another edition of the Ramadan series themed Hope don't despair allah is near on our previous episode we talked about what happened or what occurred to adam alayhi salatu wasalam as we looked at the first jews of the noble quran surah al-baqarah precisely verses 33 to 37 and in these verses allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrates to us what happened when nabi adam alayhi salatu wasalam who was honored by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given the five great honors that were not bestowed upon any other creation before or after him and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had also enabled adam alayhi salatu wasalam to have this opinion and also be given the conscience to know what is right and what is wrong yet when he was given the command by allah to stay away from a sin he committed that sin and was later on taken out of the mercy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala till he repented and sought for forgiveness and allah forgave him so with ramadan this is a month that we can all turn back to allah whatever sins that we have committed no matter how grave they are no matter how depressing they might feel because sin sometimes weighs so heavy on the heart that it even makes you feel depressed allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought this month as a month that we can turn to him seeking for forgiveness repenting to, uh, repenting to him and hopefully he would accept that repentance from us as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala count us amongst at tawabin those who repent sincerely to him and may he accept it from us as well. On today's edition of the program or today's episode, inshallah, we'll be looking at verses 155 to 157 of the Noble Quran and from Surah, Surah Baqarah as well, the second chapter and the second juz of the Noble Quran as well. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولنبلونكم بشيء من الخوف والجوع ونقص من الأموال والأنفس والثمرات وبشر الصابرين الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة قالوا إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون أولئك عليهم صلوات من ربهم ورحمة وأولئك هم المهتدون الله سبحانه وتعالى says in these verses and we'll start from the very first Allah says we will test you in anything and begins by mentioning fear. Why does Allah Azza wa Jal start with fear? Because fear is an innate emotion that every one of us as human beings we feel. We could be afraid of poverty or it could be fear of losing a loved one or it could be fear of falling sick as we see in this pandemic which is ravaging the entire globe where a lot of people a lot of times because of the news we see we live in fear and anxiety and this begins to affect our mental health and people begin to go through depression and all forms of feelings or all forms of emotions that could even lead one to committing suicide these feelings come as a result of fear fear that we would fail in our life's endeavors fear that people will not look at us and see the good that we have within us because they judge us and they aspire all forms of bad things to us fear that we will not be promoted or we will not get jobs or we will not marry these are all emotions or feelings that we feel at one point in time or the other in our lives or the second which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions as as hunger Al-Jur, hunger or poverty. The Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to seek refuge in Allah from poverty. And Sayyidina Umar Radiallahu Anhu, a great Sahaba of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that is companion, had mentioned Al-Faqr Yahdi ilal Kufr, that verily poverty leads to 
disbelief. A lot of times when people are hungry, they do not wait to know whether a thing is halal or haram. They do not want to know whether the wealth has been gotten in a pure means. Some even go to performing diabolical things in order to make wealth. And these are things that a lot of us today we see and we hear in our societies. May Allah protect us from falling amongst those who would fall into such means or who are used for such means, subhanAllah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions وَنَقْسِمْ مِنَ amwal And in the reduction of your wealth, as could be the case of numerous who were wealthy at some point in time or some stage in their lives. They could afford anything and everything. They could afford the nice expensive houses or the cars or the flashy bags or the Gucci and Chanel shoes or the clothes that made them look so expensive or the watches or they could travel to any part of the world. And then Allah tests them by taking away such wealth from them. And all of a sudden they become shadows of themselves or even worse. يعني, they have none of that wealth that they had before. Subhanallah. This is a great test as well from Allah Azza wa Jal. Wal anfus. And then the test of Allah taking away the loved ones of those around us or even us returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had said, Inna fil la Verily in death is a great test. The one who is his life is being taken or her life is being taken from them. There is a great test in this. And then finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالثَّمَرَاتِ And also test in their crops, on their food, or in agriculture. These things reducing in quantity, causing fear and hunger and panic and all forms on completely a shutdown of the society because of these tests that have come before them. But then Allah gives a caveat. وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ Give glad tidings to those who are patient. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the patient ones as those whom الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُسِيبَةً Whenever they are reached or touched with a calamity, they say, إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ They say, to Allah is our or to Allah we belong, and to Allah is our return. They return everything back to Allah Azza wa Why? Because there is no calamity that will occur except by the will of Allah. As Allah says, قُلْ لَيْ يُسِيبَنَا إِلَّا مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَنَا Say that there is no calamity that will befall us except that which Allah has ordained to befall us. وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلِ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ And upon Allah should the believers put their trust. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to turn to him, to realize that whenever a calamity touches us, whenever a difficulty comes to us, yes, it is a test from him, but it also is him calling us to draw back or to return to him. Fafirru ilallah, run to Allah, flee to Allah. Allah wants us to come back to him. Whenever Allah loves a people, he tests them in things that will make them turn to him. And that's why a scholar made a statement that it is better I experience a trial that brings me to my knees and turns me to my Rabb than a favor or a bounty or a blessing that makes me forget about Allah. How many people today, when in their time of difficulties, went on their knees, went on their foreheads, they cried to Allah in sujood, they rose their hands and they prayed to him and Allah answered their prayer. They were patient. And because of that, Allah elevated them. And how many people today were in a state of difficulty and Allah brought ease and they forgot about Allah, subhanAllah. For us to go through trials and remember Allah, this is a great sign from Him. This is a favor from Him. So don't despair, my dear viewers. Whatever you are facing in your lives, know that there is hope. Know that Allah is with us. And when we call on to Him, He will hear our cries. He will hear our call and He will respond to that call. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that May you ridillahu bihi khayran yusib min. He said, that whomever Allah wills good for them, Allah will test them. Allah will test them. Allah will test them to the point they will begin to ask, Mata Nasrullah, when is the help of Allah going to come? As the, as the verse of the Quran in Surah Al Baqarah, Allah says, Am hasibatum antadhulul jannah, walamma yatikum mathalul ladina khalaw min qablikum. Do you think you will enter paradise without facing the kind of trials that those that came before you had faced? We 
brought upon them such adversity and such difficulty and we shook them to their roots with wazulzil hatta yaquna rasul until the messengers from amongst them walladhina amanu ma'a and those who believed that were amongst them as well began to ask mata nasrullah when will the help of allah come and then allah states allah inna nasrullahi qareeb verily the help of allah is near so don't despair allah is near so be patient whenever you face such trials because in the end allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises that ulaika alayhim salawatu min rabbihim wa rahmah those who are patient and prayerful and hopeful and do not despair that allah is near in their difficulties allah has promised that he will send his salawat upon them his prayers upon them and also his mercy will be upon them and they are those who are guided so how can you bear such test that you face sometimes that makes you come down to your knees that completely makes you feel broken inside that you feel helpless and hopeless how can you turn the tides around how can you completely turn to him even while still being patient awwalan remembering that allah is the one that brought such a trial before you and he will surely lift it from you at the appropriate time the second praying fervently while also being patient it's good to be patient but you must also follow that patience with prayer as allah says wasta'inu bi sabr wa salah and seek my assistance with patience and prayer the third read about the lives of those that were that came before us the lives of the prophets the lives of our own prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the kind of difficulties he went through and the fact that these difficulties did not turn him away from keeping his trust in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for remember the gra- remember the favors allah has bestowed upon you so that that way you develop an attitude of gratitude number 5 turn to Allah in repentance why because when you repent to him seek for forgiveness from him Allah will surely relieve you of whatever difficulties you have as we find in the noble Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wan kunt wa kuntu astaghfiru rabbakum innahu kana ghaffara yursil as-samaa'a 'alaykum midrara wa yumdidukum bi amwali wa banin turn to Allah in repentance verily your lord is the most forgiving the oft forgiving he will send for you rains blessed rains from the sky and he will increase you in your wealth and in your children these are all bounties that Allah will bestow upon man and many many more i ask that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon us and may he not make us despair of his mercy because my dear brothers and sisters you shouldn't despair of the mercy of Allah especially in this month of Ramadan barakallahu feekum wa jazakumullah khairan inshallah on our next episode we will go to the third Jews and we'll be looking at verses 33 to 37 of Surah Ali Imran bi idnillah ta'ala join us for that again wa jazakumullah khair subhanakallahu wa bihamdik nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilaik
Hi guys, welcome to the first uh, YouTube video and our first vlog. What's us here? We have. Uh, Sorry guys, I'm just, I'm just busy quickly with the Bluetooth. Yes. Uh, just a click a bit with the Bluetooth. The guys just pulled yeah, up. Yeah, Bluetooth for some really cool jams. The back we have Amanullah Muhammad. With the. Welcome, Ahlan Wasahlan. Ahlan Wasahlan. And of course, Ismail with the glasses. <laughs> and uh, in the other car, we got Azim and Farid. Um, our plan is to go to uh, Signal Hill um, and to go to the Kramat on Signal Hill. We thought we'd uh, share our experience with you guys, so stay tuned. Um, we share some clips of the drive. Um, enjoy, enjoy, and uh, comment below if uh, you're liking this experience. And uh, you know what I'm saying? Salam, salam. What are you doing? The nice orange on the yeah, He's feeling a bit uh, down, so. Uh, the vitamin C is vital. So this is the fun car. <laughs> and this is the, the late car. The late car. The late car. And the, the latest car very will be cooling up very soon. No snacks, no oranges. So, so yeah. The late yeah. Um, the late car will come very soon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, we're just waiting for Shukri. Um, he'll probably get us there. Yes, the late car. I wanted to say the late car will be coming soon. Yeah, that is the light call. The light call. That is the light call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll be showing you that. Because happy to say that. The light call. The light call. The light call. The light call. Yeah. Okay. See you guys. Here we go. Farida, Farida, Far. The safari goes to Kati. Off he goes, there he goes, clientele. 150 is special. <laughs> That's if you're lucky. <laughs> So guys, so we just arrived at Signal Hill. We're driving here at this uh, magnificent mountain. And uh, yeah, we, uh, Signal Hill is a very iconic place where are they like a destination for tourists when they come to Cape Town. But uh, the most beautiful site besides the city itself, uh, and greater than the city itself, is the Kramat that is buried here. Yeah? If you haven't been yet, it's a beautiful site, a beautiful place to be, and uh, we'll share that experience with you. And for those guys that are wondering what is the Karama, Osama would liberate. So it's basically one of our fo uh, forefathers. Uh, we call them <coughs> forefathers, if you want to put it in the English term. And uh, they were the pioneers of uh, bringing Islam to Cape Town. And uh, the reason why we uh, visit them because they uh, uh, played a uh, major role in us being Muslim today and uh, we go pay our respects basically and basically that um, seeing that we are heading towards Heritage Day this is actually our true heritage of and uh, that experience of true heritage is coming from our forefathers as well so celebrating with us we are visiting out of respect to Jehovah Okay, so we finally arrived here at uh, the Karamat of uh, uh, the Honorable Sheikh uh, Muhammad uh, Hassan Ghaibisha. Um, unfortunately, the, the place is locked, so we can't show you guys footage of the inside. I suppose it's due to COVID-19, 
at the uh, restricting entrance to it. But um, one thing we did notice is a very quiet and peaceful place. Um, and it's uh, right, be right behind the camera is uh, Lion's Head over here. And if you go around, it's Table Mountain. So, um, and uh, we'll take you guys now as well around the, the, the Kramat itself. Um, uh, to show you the beauty of it and the the reason or the, the why the, the the sheikh is buried here um, actually I read up about him and uh, he was one of the students of Tuang uh, Guru and he decided that he's going to stay behind to teach Islam he was uh, come, come, come. <laughs> yeah, Shukri okay so Shukri has just arrived the total late car yeah, yeah. But Alhamdulillah is on time. Who is the late call? <laughs> Who is the late call, guys? Who is? Okay, so guys, this is officially the latest call. Yes. Shukri. Hi guys. How well, are you doing? I'm well, I'm well. Am I late for the... No, no, no. You, you're on time. You're on time. Get out. On time is late. Why do you look like you're in the club? So we arrived here at the Kramat of... Uh, Muhammad Hassan uh, Baby Shah and uh, it's a beautiful scene here yeah? and we're going to show you guys around but unfortunately the place is locked we can't get in probably because of COVID-19 but uh, stay tuned we're going to show you more and hopefully do something special for you guys here yeah? uh, and maybe grab a bite to eat after I don't know that sounds good uh, that sounds good the of the so tell us where are we where are we at the so moment we are we at the foot of Lion's Head uh, signal is at the foot of Lion's Head and just next to it is Table Mountain. So, uh, as you can see, the, the chef that is married here, he died on this side and the rest of the year passed away here. Um, it's a beautiful place, it just shows you uh, the level of. Uh, it's so quiet here also. <laughs> Guys, the sun just set now here at uh, Signal Hill, Alhamdulillah, and we had a lovely sunset. And uh, we are definitely going to continue the festivities of our um, gathering here. We're happy to see all the brothers together. And we want to also say happy birthday to the guy behind the camera. His birthday was yesterday. Selamat Abiyah. We got our Dhan live. Signal here. Coming to you live, Kari Shukri. I don't know what keep is that. But from okay. KB Downey. Is that to wait, no? One, one. One, one. Right, so just tell them what happened now. <laughs> so um, we were trying to do something, you know, experiment with the uh, sun sitting, you know. Yes. And we we're trying to do that. And you know, what's the signal, you know? 
And Usama just asked us to retake that and we were almost done with that. Usama, do you have anything to say about that? So guys, uh, this is the camera man. Uh, hopefully we're going to yeah, have... Just have some feedback. My ankle is very sore. Yes. Yes. You can see the very mountainous area. Yes. Um, and as you can see, I didn't come well prepared mm. for this uh, terrain. No, 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 he's looking very well. He's lying. No, I'm talking about my ankles. He's not feeling well. <laughs> Um, okay. So you're older guys, don't worry. So we just like to say slama to our Amir Sap over here. He's behind the he was behind the camera all the mm. time. Uh, would you like to send a birthday I message to him? I just want to say something that uh, Farid just told me now that as we're coming here, that for Taj Prison, Farid is gonna cut his hair. Yeah. Oh, no. Farid, we need to cut his heel. No, no, that, that was an opportunity to, to promote your business. It's Go ahead. We need to cut his on this heel. Yes. So, wow. we, can ease, we can get the tree here, inshallah. Wow. So, uh, comment below if you want to catch my ear. I can catch you anywhere. If you want anybody to I can catch you on top of If the anybody hill wants, also. okay, I'm just gonna make it. Oh. No. Wow. Okay, there. Wow. Okay, we had an ankle that's situation. So, um, that's what I'm saying. My, uh, no, my ankles also, I never came prepared. Um, but yeah, if wait. anybody wants to cut the ear, yeah. 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 Like, yeah, yeah. 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 What do you guys think about that price? Goodbye, Cape Town. This is what I like with Amir too. <laughs> Goodbye. So, uh, guys, <laughs> guys, before we go, before we go, Sam, I just want to say one more thing. So, we have been invited by um, our Amir to have supper with him. Um, so, he is definitely going to um, pay for our supper, which is to hire Hendrix. So let's see, we're going to camera and we're going to see if he's going to pay for our supper because it's his birthday or we're going to have to pay for our own. We'll have to see about that. Guys, I just want to say um, it's my first time here on the Sydney Wow, we didn't just know that. Slamat, you give him a, a congratulations. Signal Yom Mubarak. Signal Yom Mubarak. Wellington for the past. Yeah, welcome to the world. Yeah. I've lived. There's a lot of life. There's a lot of life. Uh, very angry so at the moment, guys. I feel <laughs> that Azhar went to different parts already, like he was in Macau, but he wasn't here, and he loves here. Yeah. Um, I think the highlight so of, of this... I think he's still on honeymoon, he's, he's getting the, the, the view of Cape Town yeah. still. So. Yeah. Anyway, yes. let's go pray. And, and let's eat. Time to pray the bolts. <laughs> Yo. Wow. We ended up our night off beautifully with a nice meal for Shukri. Okay. And <laughs> I just like to say Shukran to uh, the guys for coming out at this uh, lovely day and lovely outing down in Islam. And um, yeah. Yeah, that's it from us, guys. Um, please feel free to. Subscribe, like, share, tell us if we need to make more videos, more vlogs, tell us we need new ideas, so oh, tell us what it is you're looking That's a us. great pitch, that's a great pitch. I know, yeah, I know, I know, I just ate nine, I'm feeling a bit happier, so I can't speak much more. So guys, get out there, go to Signal, you'll see places in Cape Town, we've seen, as of for the first time I've seen uh, Signal Hill, so... How do you feel today? Emotional. <laughs> Emotional. <laughs> Yeah, that's so it's, it's Aziz's first time uh, at uh, Signal Hill and at Signal Hill Mubarak for him. And that's it from us guys. Uh, thank you very much Assalamu for watching our video. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.